My name is Chris Deeran and I'm the Director of Reform Scotland. A warm welcome to you all for today's event, which is in partnership with the New Statesman. Uh, and it's great to see such a big audience today. Uh, after a busy few weeks, this is Reform Scotland's last event before next Thursday's Holyrood election. And it seems fitting then that our guest today is the woman who is expected to win it. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon has been First Minister of Scotland for the past six and a bit years uh, and is unarguably the dominant Scottish politician of our times. For the past 12 months or so, she's guided the country through the treacherous waters of the COVID pandemic. And whatever your politics, I think most people agree she has done so with integrity, empathy and commitment. It's been a tough year in other ways too. The fallout with her predecessor Alex Salmond over the handling of sexual assault allegations and then the drama of the subsequent inquiries. These were traumatic for everyone involved, I think, and, and cast something of a pal over Scottish politics and perhaps even at times the, the national mood. And with the polls suggesting the SNP is closer than ever before to securing its goal of independence, we've witnessed a bizarre spectacle really of the Yes movement fracturing somewhat, in particular with the launch of the ALBA party. Uh, there are also internal disputes in relation to the style of Ms Sturgeon's leadership, the possible timing of a referendum, alternative mechanisms from, for securing independence, and in policy areas such as the Gender Reform Act. There is perhaps an inevitability after 14 years in power that divisions in the governing party are finally beginning to emerge. Just think of the state of the Conservatives by the mid-1990s or Labour by the late 2000s. So it's quite something then that the SNP remain so far ahead in the polls such that this election is more of a procession than a competition. That's the way it feels anyway. Um, and as the First Minister rather neatly put it during one of the televised leaders debates, she's actually the only candidate asking voters to elect her as First Minister and to run a government. So make of that what you will. Uh, the main unanswered questions in this election are who's going to win second place? whether the SNP can win an overall majority on May the 6th or a pro-independence majority at Holyrood with the Scottish Greens, maybe. And whether, if they do so, they'll be able to hold a referendum in the first half of the next parliament, as they'd like to. Um, there's the very real prospect of a tense constitutional standoff with Boris Johnson and Westminster in the offing. We're going to start today with a conversation between me and the First Minister and then move on to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, as I'm sure many of you will, Please send it to me using the message button on your Zoom screen in front of you, uh, and we'll select the best for the First minister, minister to answer. Given we've got such a large audience, you'll have a better chance of being chosen if your question is interesting, original and polite. So uh, please try for that. And I'll just remind you again to mute. Uh, hello, First Minister. Hello. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'm sure you're, uh, you're well, not physically rushing around, but uh, digitally rushing around at the moment. Both. <laughs> both. Um, I, I was just thinking that this is the third time I've interviewed you as First Minister. On the first occasion, I managed to meet you use the F word, which I think you said was a first, at least in public. <laughs> I was going to say that the first. I'm <laughs> not sure that would be have been an honest answer. The first in public, perhaps. Yeah, yeah it was a, a feather in my cap. The second time, which was in 2017, you told me you'd been out jogging around Arthur's seat in your lycra, <laughs> dragging your poor staff with you and with other runners goggle-eyed in disbelief as you shuffled past. Is that Are you still getting out there for the, the jog? Uh, not so much. Um, no. It's fair to say the, the jogging uh, endeavour didn't last all that long, but that was more <laughs> to do with uh, lack of time than lack of motivation, uh, or at least that's my uh, answer and, and I'm sticking to it. But after this election is over, I'm doing a lot of walking uh, in the course of the election campaign. So that's uh, helping keep me uh, on just the right side of fitness. Um, and I'm obsessed with my step count at the moment. Um, Have you got uh, one of those thingies that tells you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But no, the jogging didn't last that long. Um, and uh, but who knows, I might get back to it. Um, I have to say, just listening to your introduction there kind of almost brought me out in a cold sweat. I hate listening to people talking about it, the election as if it's a foregone conclusion. I uh, it doesn't that. feel like a procession rather than a competition. Uh, and maybe it's my early uh, experience in politics of losing every election I contested that just uh, means that I can never uh, and should never treat an election as if the outcome is, is certain. So, um, I'll be taking it very, very seriously for the, all the remaining days of the campaign. I'm sure that I'm sure that's wise. You, you seem to me quite a different person from the one I 
talked to for the first time as First Minister in 2016. You've obviously been through a great deal since, uh, as any First Minister would be. Uh, undoubtedly, you've had various corners knocked off you again, as anyone would. And we discussed back then the nature of leadership. And I think you'd been leafing through the Margaret Thatcher biography for maybe some insights from there. I don't mean that in any sort of uh, way. Uh, we talked a bit about some of Barack Obama's coping techniques, removing non-essential decisions from his entry, limiting wardrobe choices, that kind of thing. Now, obviously, leading through the last year in such unprecedented circumstances, that's had very particular lessons. And I just wondered if you might reflect a bit on that, but also on what you've learned about leadership in your entire span as, as First Minister. What do you know that now that you didn't know then and how has your view of what good leadership entails evolved uh, during your spell in Butte House? Um, I think possibly the thing I've learned um, above everything else is that you can't be a leader uh, and act as a leader as if you're you know, taking part in some kind of performance or trying to create a persona, you fundamentally have to be yourself and allow your own personality, your own instincts, your own approach to leadership and to life to, to guide what you do. I think that's perhaps been the most important thing I've learned. And I think that has been underlined for me over the past year. But that approach perhaps has also uh, helped me to navigate the challenges of the past year and, and steer the country through in a way uh, in which I wasn't just asking people to do really difficult things, but able to explain to them why it was important. And by and large, although not everybody will have agreed with every decision, far from it, and not every decision I've got right, but by and large, I think we have uh, managed to, to move together through this as one. Uh, the other thing I've learned and for somebody like me, uh, who, who can be quite ponderous, um, and actually, perhaps a bit unusually for a politician, I, I like to see things from both sides of the argument. And, and the danger in a politician is that becomes a bit of a, a paralysis on decision making. So the other thing I've learned, and again, this has been particularly true in the last year, is that indecision and failing to act is often more damaging than taking a decision, even if you get the decision wrong. Uh, it's often the, the consequences of indecision uh, that are much greater than the consequences of any decision you can take. And that's been absolutely true in the past year. When I look back over the course of the pandemic, the things I agonise most about, and you know, I agonise over every aspect of our handling of this, and, and to some extent probably always will, but the things I agonise most about are the things that I worry we didn't do quickly enough or the things that we didn't do enough of uh, as opposed to the decisions we took and, and whether they were right or wrong. So, I, I mean, there's lots I've learned. Um, I suppose the last year has, and maybe this is longevity in, in politics generally and uh, as First Minister, although of course I don't think I've been First Minister for nearly long enough yet, I should just get that on the record. Um, but I suppose the other thing, that's changed in me over the past year in particular is I'm much less tolerant of just some of the traditional, you know, nonsense around politics. And, and that cuts both ways. So some of the things I will have engaged in and indulged in in the past, as well as, you know, the things the opposition do, I just think I've got less patience for. And uh, hopefully that might lead me to uh, be a better politician as well as a better leader in future. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I'll just think about how to phrase the next question, given the, the point you made. The polls suggest your party is about to win a fourth term and a second term for you as First Minister. And the previous two British long governing, example, long governing examples that I mentioned, so the Thatcher and Blair eras, ended pretty messily and with the polls either exceptionally narrow or the opposition out of sight. Yet today, with all of that time span behind you, you guys still remain 20 or so points ahead. I'm sure you'd say good things about your government. You've had your ups and downs like all the others. You've done some good things, made some mistakes. Much of your front bench has been in the public eye for ages. And, you know, there's usually a degree of voter fatigue associated with that. They just get fed up looking at the same faces all the time. With all that in mind, how do you explain the ongoing gigantic gap between your party and you and the rest? Are the others just rubbish or is there something else happening in there? I, so... If I can be, I, I won't use sort of pejorative language like that. I'll, I'll leave that to you. But there's there's a bit of both at play there. I often think it is a source of real frustration to many of our country's commentators that 
despite all of the flaws and failings and fragilities you all see in us, and some of them will be fair comment, others perhaps less so, and we can maybe get into some of that later on. But despite all of that, the public seem to still quite like us um, and trust us and, and think that we are, all things considered, the best bet for the future uh, governance of the country. Now, as I say, we've got an election a week on Thursday. That may all change next Thursday. I hope not, uh, but I don't take that for granted. Um, and I think that is down to a couple of things. I think the public, by and large, are a lot smarter than they're given credit for. And the public can look at the record of a government, uh, its strengths and weaknesses, can look at the circumstances in which a government has been operating and make allowances for the you know, unforeseen things that have made it difficult to do certain things, particularly over the past year. Uh, also be pretty blunt about mistakes and areas where they think we've not done well enough, but weigh all of that in the round and, and come to a balanced decision. And, and I also think, and this is, I think, less understood, and it sits apart from or maybe above all of the, the discussion and uh, focus and, and scrutiny of individual policy areas, the public will look at a bunch of people and decide whether they instinctively trust them and like them and want them to be representing and and leading their country or not. And again, that's part of the decision that will be made. And so far, thankfully, uh, the public seem to be comfortable uh, in terms of the, the majority, the greatest number of the population in the SNP's leadership. Um, but, you know, allied to that, and I would say this, wouldn't I, because I'm talking about my opponents here, I think there has been a real failure of opposition in Scotland over the past uh, number of years where neither of the main opposition parties have really managed to, to get into their stride and at a very basic level even understand what the role of an opposition is and how to succeed as an opposition and use that as the stepping stone to starting to be seen as a credible alternative government in waiting. And I can speak about that with some kind of authority because the SNP, if you think back to uh, the the early days of the Scottish Parliament, the SNP was a bit like that. We we didn't, we took a while to really understand what opposite, constructive, responsible, tough opposition involved to master that. And then in the 2003 to 2007 Parliament, particularly in the latter stages of that, start to use that to present ourselves credibly as an alternative government. And neither of the main parties have really got anywhere close to that. I mean, I remember at the last election, Ruth Davidson's big you know, supposed selling point, which worked up to a point for her was, you know, I'm on a journey, it's a two-phase journey, I'm asking people to elect the Tories as the opposition this time round to hold the SNP to account, and then next time I'll be putting forward uh, a, a plan for government. They haven't really managed to get beyond that first stage, in fact, I would say they've regressed somewhat from that period, and then Scottish Labour I'm not sure I'd, I would know how to sum up Scottish Labour over the past decade or so. And, uh, you know, impressed maybe by over Anna the next period... They, what? What do you think of Anna Sarwa? I think most people I know think he's had quite a good campaign. He's pretty appealing. I, I so, like... Yeah. I sort of admit to the thing that traditionally, uh, by common uh, standards in politics, you're not meant to do. I like Anna. I, obviously, I, I, I know Anna. I have known Anna for some time. The first kind of serious election I stood in was against his dad, and uh, his dad beat me, of course, uh, back then. So I've, I've known the Sarwar family uh, for quite a long time. I like Anas. I think he's very capable. I think the sitting on the fence and just pretending I'm above the fray will work for so long. And I think you can already see that he's running out of road on that, even in this campaign. You can't be a political leader in and just decide that you're you're not going to decide what side of big issues that you are on. Uh, but I think he's got a lot of ability. I, I'll leave it there because as well as being an opposition leader, he is actually my opponent in my constituency. So I don't <laughs> want to talk him up too much. You're sure you put the black spot on him by saying nice <laughs> things anyway. Um, let's talk about a second referendum. So you've said you want to hold one in the first half of the next parliament. And Boris Johnson has repeatedly said that's not going to happen. What's going to happen when this unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Well, I'm not sure, uh, looking just at the developments of today, that Boris Johnson is an immovable object. I think <laughs> Boris Johnson is in 
what I can only politely describe as deep, deep doo-doo um, right now. But I'm saying that lightheartedly. There is a really serious set of very grave allegations now swirling around Boris Johnson and, you know, his longevity as Prime Minister may not be quite as uh, certain uh, as we might have thought just a matter of weeks ago, but that's uh, obviously another matter. Um, in, in terms of the timing of a referendum, you know, let me make this clear and this frustrate some people on my own side of the independence argument. Um, I, I know that, but it's important for me to be straight with people. Uh, continuing to deal with COVID and get us through COVID and into the recovery from COVID is my priority. That's what needs my focus for as long as it takes. So a referendum can only come after we're out of this immediate COVID crisis. I hope for all sorts of reasons that that will be in a time frame of you know, before the end of 2023, the first half of the parliamentary term, but I can't guarantee that. And that principle of the COVID uh, situation coming first is one that will be my uh, sort of commitment for as long as it takes. But whenever we get to that, if there is a pro-independence majority in the Scottish Parliament, you know, the basic principles of democracy have to count for something. The fact that we are still in Scotland having a debate about what do we do if Westminster refuses to respect Scottish democracy is in itself, I think, a really powerful argument for us not being subject to Westminster vetoes on what Scotland wants to do. Um, I've been equally clear that not just because I think it's the right and proper way to go, but if we want to turn a majority for independence into independence. It has to involve that majority expressing itself in a legitimate legal process. So I'm, I have no truck with illegal wildcat referendums because they won't deliver independence. Catalonia is living proof of that. Uh, so it has to be a legal legitimate process for all of those reasons. Um, I hope that whoever's prime minister, if there is a majority in the Scottish Parliament, we can negotiate that sensibly the way, in the same way that was done in the run up to 2014. If there is a continued block on that, we will bring forward legislation. Um, if that legislation is unchallenged, by definition, it will be a legal referendum. And if it is challenged by Westminster, and I hope it doesn't come to this, then that will have to be resolved legally and we will vigorously defend the right of the Scottish Parliament to allow people in Scotland to choose. But we're only even talking about this because we've got the absurd situation of there being a question mark over whether or not Scottish democracy is respected, which mm -hmm. tells its own story. Well, it's interesting you talk about, you know, the possibility of going to court and, and testing some of those arguments and reflecting on what you said before that. Some of your judgment, maybe a lot of it must be based on what the rest of the world is going to think about the way in which Scotland becomes independent, the way the process is handled, the fact that there are good relationships with the rest of the UK. There needs to be a sort of earned legitimacy in the chancelleries and palaces of Europe and, and elsewhere. So uh, how does that much does that weigh on your thoughts when you're dealing with people on your own side of the, the, the constitutional argument who are saying, come on, let's just go for it or let's find another democratic event to, to use? Do, are you comfortable with that idea that actually the way Scotland becomes independent is as important as becoming independent itself. Absolutely, because that matters in terms of the legitimacy and the acceptance and the recognition of it on the part of our European and international partners. And, you know, it doesn't matter the extent to which that might frustrate us, it might frustrate me because it makes it seem as if it's taken too long and all the, all the rest of it, but you can't magic these things away. Um, independence achieving independence depends first and foremost on persuading a majority of people in Scotland it's the right future and I think we're closer to that than we've ever been but I don't think we can yet say we've absolutely certainly got there and that persuasion involves being open and honest with people about the challenges and the barriers along the way but also the massive opportunities it will give us if we do it properly. It then depends on allowing that majority to express itself in a legitimate process so that it is then accepted by people across the world. If you don't tick one or more of these boxes, we might all make ourselves feel better by pretend, you know, pretending that we are doing it in a way that is effective, but we won't actually get to the end point, which is Scotland being an independent country. And, and that, in my view, is what is important. And doing it properly matters because 
I think you should always do big, important things properly. But it, if we don't do it properly, we don't achieve the outcome we want. And, you know, I know this frustrates some people, but I don't do anybody on my own side of the argument, let alone the country, any favours by glibly pretending there are shortcuts or magic wands or ways in which we can just take whatever support we've got right now and bulldoze our way to independence through super majorities or whatever kind of language you choose to use to describe what is just presenting to people a, a false prospectus. And, and doing it properly. Uh, you know, you've, you've uh, said, or certainly it's been mentioned in the past that, you know, you'd be comfortable with a sort of 60% support for independence in the polls would, would seem like give, it would give you a decent cushion to go into a referendum confident that you can, you, you're likely to win it. Um, but obviously if you, you know, if you win 51-49, you'll take it, I'm sure. But it's not a great way to launch a new country with the, the, the electorate effectively completely split on that. So when you're thinking about that, about the mechanisms and the the need to win, there's nothing you can do really to ensure that it isn't 51-49 other than campaign. Um, so what's your sort of thinking about that, about about well, the viability so and the, yeah. I've, I've incidentally, I've never said the polls have to be at 60% before sure. we have a referendum. It's all, that's often a comment attributed to me. I've never actually said it. And I don't, I don't actually believe it in, in that way. I, I, I think we have to have a referendum when the, the time is right for the country, which is not in the grip of a, a global pandemic. Um, and yes, of course, I, I would want that hopefully to be at the point where I, I was confident we were going to win it. But the interests of the country overall are, are what's most important. Um, you only need a simple majority. Clearly, I would be campaigning to you know, have as big a majority for independence as possible. As it happens, I, I kind of feel in my gut the next time it will be, I, I think Scotland will vote yes next time, and I think it will be by a bigger margin than that, because I think the, the direction of travel and the momentum um, is in that direction. I also think that even if you did have an outcome that was 51-49, that would be the simple majority that was needed. But what struck me in the last referendum campaign was the number of people I spoke to. In fact, I spoke to somebody just a week ago on the campaign trail who really encapsulated this. The number of people who voted no, who said that the minute Scotland voted yes, they would be enthusiastic independent supporters because they'd get behind the decision of the country and want to make it a success. I spoke to somebody um, on a doorstep just a, a week or so ago and she said she went into the polling booth uh, intending to vote no and did vote no because her head couldn't quite get her to yes. But she made a promise to herself that if the vote went the other way, she would go to George Square to celebrate a yes vote because her heart knew that that would not be a disaster and actually it was important for people to get behind that if that's what happened. And I actually think there's probably quite a lot of people in that category. So, you know, doing it properly, doing it the right way is important for the legitimacy of it and the legitimacy of it really, really matters. And I think everybody who, like me, passionately wants Scotland to be independent and passionately believes it's the right future for the country has to respect the importance of that legitimacy point. And outside the, the 2014 yes uh, group, yes voters, since Brexit, we've seen the number in, in favour of uh, independence in the polls creeping up a bit. It seems to have come back down slightly, but it was over 50% for quite a, quite a long time. Um, what do you detect in the yes movement with these new people, the indie curious coming into it and what their priorities are, which are probably in a sense a bit different from the priorities of the 2014 gang? Does, does the, does the, do the arguments change? Does the, the sort of emotion around it begin to morph so that people who were known in 2014 are now bringing their ideas to the party? Um, I think if we're sensible, we embrace the, well, obviously we embrace people who are moving from no to yes, or even open-minded to that and listen to the, the reasons why people are moving and the, the issues they still require to be persuaded around in order to perhaps complete that journey. You know, if we ignore that or decide that, well, they're not supporting it for the right reasons, so we don't want them, then we're, we're doomed to failure. I'm not so sure, like, if I listen to people who are on that journey and think about why I want independence, I'm not sure there is a massive gulf between us. Uh, I've never been, um, you know, I'd made a speech back in 2012 or in the run-up to 2014, drawing on, you know, a great uh, sort of uh, 
exposition of Neil McCormick, where he drew the distinction between uh, utilitarian and existential nationalists. I, I've never been, I'm, I'm patriotic, I, Scotland's a nation, I, I think Scotland as a nation should be independent, but I've never been that kind of just because we're a nation we should be independent existential nationalists. It's, for me it's a very much a utilitarian argument, it's about building a better country and I think those who voted no, and many people who voted no will never be persuaded because they are you know, as passionately pro the United Kingdom as I am pro independence, and I respect that. But those perhaps more in the middle, it is very much about, okay, demonstrate to me that independence makes Scotland a better place to live, that it gives us greater ability to, to tackle the challenges we face and take advantage of our opportunities. And so I, I think there's a great synergy there already, and we have to you know, go the extra mile to persuade people of that and also to demonstrate that an independent Scot, because again, independence is for me not an end in itself. It is a means to the end of a better country. And therefore we've got to demonstrate that and effectively live that in how we prosecute the argument. And if I have a worry about the the, the super majority cohort, which I, I think can be overstated in terms of its numbers, is that they strike a pose that is, uh, or at least if, if I was in that unpersuaded but open-minded category, I would hear it as they're not interested in me, they're not interested in persuading me, they're just interested in how they can bulldoze their way over me to get to independence as quickly as possible. And then there's lots of questions around it about the kind of country that they're actually envisaging. So I, I think we've got to be patient about building the case because by building the case, we build the majority and then we deliver independence. So it might... The way I articulate it might be a lot less glamorous than some others who think it's just about, you know, sort of arm wrestling and flexing the muscle and demonstrating how committed uh, we are. But actually, the patient, hard work, committed way of doing it is the way that I think is going to deliver the success we want. And, and obviously, there's nothing more important in terms of building Scotland than education. So let's let's talk a little bit about about that. In the first interview we did in 2016, you told me that education and the attainment gap would be your yardstick. You, you said it on a number of occasions to, to many people. Um, and I've got a quote from you that is, it's not something I'm going to say is job done in a year or two years or probably even five years, but that's the one I'm going to measure myself against. So it's now been six and a bit years. How would you judge your achievements in education? Um, I think we've made progress, but I think we've got a lot more to do and, and I don't shy away from that. Um, if I take some of uh, the, the, the things we've done sort of around the, the actual performance in schools, which I'll come back to in a second, some of the, the big changes we've made, the expansion of early years education, uh, for example, some of the work we have done and will carry forward if re-elected to tackle child poverty because we should never forget that one of the big drivers of the attainment gap are the the life conditions and the the poverty in which many children are living in so some of that work uh, is really important and we've made big strides forward there uh, in terms of school performance you know if, if we look at the yardsticks around uh, level five national fives level six hires uh, we have reduced the attainment gap by about a third in the first by a lesser amount, by about a fifth in, in the second. Uh, we've got more to do. That We've got more young people, which was one of the things I was really keen that we did make progress on. We've got more young people from more deprived backgrounds now going to university than has ever been the case before. So we've made progress, but we haven't made enough progress. And therefore that has to be to continue to be a, a drive and focus of what we do. And um, sometimes, we we should we forget that if, if we if we do manage to close that attainment gap, uh, we will be the first country anywhere in the world to do it. Now we've got a long way to go to get there, but the attainment gap is not unique to Scotland. Uh, perhaps what is, if not entirely unique, then uh, more unusual is the fact that we are being so open about the existence of that and the need to close it. And I remain as serious about that as I was when you first interviewed me all these years ago. And, and you know, open about the need to close it. But then th there are some who say that what you're not open about is the existing state of things. So you, you also told me one of the big problems is a lack of objective evidence. Uh, 
Um, apologies, Thank first you. minute's altered bit. Oh, are you there? Yep. Yeah, so you also told me one of the big problems is a lack of objective evidence to tell us just how good or not it is. If I'm going to say, judge me against this, then I need to know where we're starting from and then be able to measure where we're getting to. And isn't that one of the, maybe the gaping flaws in our education system? We've withdrawn from the international comparator studies. The OECD report into Cur Curriculum for Excellence, which you've had for months now, is being held back till after the election. Yeah. Professor Lindsay Patterson says we know less about what's going on in Scotland schools than we have any time since the 1950s. Uh, and in fact, our Commission on School Reform produced a, an education manifesto uh, the other week, proposing almost a, an office for national statistics for education so that we can gather and analyse more, not less data, and then make sound decisions based on the evidence. They don't seem to think that what we have at the present is anywhere near up to doing the job. Um, I mean, something like that's a good idea, isn't it? Having a, an office for educational statistics. Uh, possibly, yeah. I, I'm look, I'm open to suggestions. I'm I'm happy to consider that. We uh, are in what most people would say is the most important international comparator study, which is PISA, which is you know had some tough uh, messages for us over the past few years. Uh, we have had the SSLN uh, study, which was a uh, a, a sample survey that I don't think, I, remember, I think I remember the first discussion we had where that study did not give me as First Minister the, the in-depth school by school or even local authority by local authority uh, measurements that we needed. So we now publish data from the new assessment or relatively new assessments that are now done, which have been controversial. Um, and of course, it will take time for the time series of that to build up. Um, the OECD uh, point I was going to push back slightly on there was the, OE the sort of we've held the OECD report back till after the election. That is not the case. The OECD uh, are in charge of the timetable. It's an independent review uh, being done by a pretty respected organisation and they are in charge of the timing of that. It was delayed because of COVID. They stopped their staff from travelling, which restricted their ability to complete in the original timetable. But we haven't held back the report. I'm as anxious as anybody for that report to be published. So um, you, you don't have it yet? Uh, we've seen a, a, a draft of that. They and this correspondence was published before the election. They have said we are not allowed to publish that. We put some summary information in SPICE, the Scottish Parliament Research Centre for other party leaders to look at. I'm not sure whether they all took that opportunity or not. I genuinely don't know. So we have put as much out there as we can, but the OECD are in charge of what we publish when we publish it. I don't think this report, based on what I do know about the direction of travel, is, is going to be the big denunciation of Scottish education that people are expecting it to be uh, and I don't think it would be fair if it was because I, I don't think that would be accurate but I do think it is going to have some uh, big recommendations I would expect it to have some big recommendations around the governance of education perhaps your office of education statistics is one we could take forward in in that uh, in that round but the report when it comes will be an important moment, but I just want to very clearly push back against any suggestion that we have manipulated the timing because of the election. It is fundamentally not true. Okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Let's move on to um, the Gender Reform Act, um, which, you know, has been one of the more, well, the issue itself has been one of the more uh, controversial or divisive, certainly on social media and, and in, in other chambers. Social media is debate. not real life. No, no, it isn't. But beyond that as well, you know, there's been well, a lot I'm not of so sure about that, actually. About well, in your own party, there's uh, a fair amount of debate going on about it. And in particular, the right to self-identification. Um, you kind of leapt ahead of the debate, I felt, by promising to make self-ID much easier, maybe before the full conversation had been had in society. is isn't always a bad thing for a politician to do. But then you face something of a backlash from some women in your own party. You know, a lot of women I speak to are, are pretty unhappy about the way they think that things are, are, are evolving. And they say it's possible to want to ease the, the plight of the trans community, to deliver equality to them, but also not to want to steamroll over many women's concerns about their own rights. So I don't doubt the strength of your convictions on this, but I wonder now whether you wish that you'd handled it slightly differently and in a way that would have allowed people to debate and then come to a conclusion rather than almost prevent, pre provide them with the conclusion and then ask them to catch up? Well, I remember, so I, I'm always open to could we have handled things differently because nobody wants any issue to end up being toxic and divisive in the way this one has. So 
Let me maybe, maybe unpack some of that. You know, you said that Scotland has kind of jumped ahead, and I know you were talking about the debate domestically, but in actual fact, Scotland is behind mm -hmm. many, many other countries who have already simplified the process for uh, gender identification. You know, people can go through a process to change gender. That's not new. The proposals are about trying to remove some of the trauma and bureaucracy and associated stigma around that. Now, countries like, you know, the Republic of Ireland have already done it without, as far as I am aware, the, uh, the furore or any of the concerns that are being expressed here materialising in any way, shape or form. Uh, secondly, I remember taking part in advance of the last Scottish election in a stonewall hustings where every single party leader said they were committed to this. So there was no sense then that we were doing something that was massively controversial. It was something that had been done in other countries that was recognised about the simplification of an existing procedure, not a new procedure altogether. We had a consultation on it before we put forward the, the plans for legislation. So I, I don't accept that there was no consultation. What I do accept is that the issue has become horribly divided and that there are some you know, very real concerns. Uh, and when I say real concerns, I mean that the people who have these concerns uh, feel them very strongly and, and believe they are real. I think there's a lot of misinformation and downright factual inaccuracy around this debate. And there are some, uh, and I'm not talking about women who fear the erosion of women's rights. Those concerns do have to be properly addressed. But there are some in this debate, frankly, uh, who are using it as a cover for transphobia. Uh, and there are some who are transphobic who use transphobia as a cover for homophobia and misogyny and rolling back progress uh, more generally here. So I think we've got to be really clear sighted about how we move forward here. It's very I'm important feminist... though, that you separate out the, 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 those people, the, the transphobics, well, as you say, and women, say, who have, as you said, very real and understandable concerns. They might read about women's aid groups being denied funding because they don't meet whatever the, the, the new criteria Well, I, are. again, you know, that, that I think is one of the pieces of misinformation. So I'm, I've, I've been a feminist for as long as I can remember. I'm a feminist to my fingertips. I would never support anything that I thought was an erosion of women's rights. There's a lot of threat to women's rights out there right now. The people who want to roll back on abortion rights. Abusive men have always been and remain the risk to women's rights and to women's safety. Um, one of the other misconceptions at the heart of this is that simplifying the process of gender recognition um, takes away the protections and the safeguards women have under the Equalities Act, for example, access to uh, single sex spaces. That is not the case. There is nothing in the gender recognition reforms that changes at all the protections in the Equalities Act. So I recognise the responsibility to work through these concerns and to address these concerns, but I also recognise the responsibility on behalf of you know, one of the most stigmatised and discriminated against groups in society, which is trans people, to also push back against transphobia and prejudice. And, you know, we need to detoxify this. We need to try to depolarise it. Mm -hmm. But we need to, and I need to continue to make the argument, because it's one I believe very strongly, is that the tension between women's rights and trans rights is an artificial one. Uh, you can be both pro-women's rights uh, and pro-trans rights, and the two uh, do not need to be seen as in conflict with each other. So there's obviously still work to be done there, but you know we should never forget that the threats to the safety of women are abusive men, and and that is the kind of key touchstone here that we should never lose sight of. Okay, uh, let's move on to the economy, which we know is going to be tough over the next few years after the year that we've had. Um, the IFS published a report this week that was critical of the, all three main parties spending pledges in their manifestos, which it, it said showed, quotes, a disconnect from the fiscal reality the next Scottish government is likely to face. It said it, it was implausible there'd be enough money to keep pace with rising demand and costs in the NHS. Now, you are the one who will say no more strongly than is likely to have to implement your manifesto. So what's your response to the IFS saying you've basically just gone a bit crazy with the numbers? I don't agree. Look, I, I respect they the IFS. I always take crazy. very seriously what the IFS say, but every election I've ever fought, organisations like the IFS say you can't afford your spending commitments. It's almost a staple of an election campaign. And 
every single year the SNP has been in government, every year I've been First Minister, we've balanced our budget and we funded the commitments that we have made. But in terms of this manifesto, we published as government in January what's called the medium term financial strategy, projecting the country's finances over the next five years. That was available for every party to base their manifesto on. It's got a, so it's based on the projections of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the OBR, and our assumptions about the growth in the block grant. It's got a, a high scenario, a central scenario, and a, a low scenario. We have based our manifesto and the commitments in our manifesto uh, below, just below, about half a billion pounds below the central scenario, so the, the most likely scenario. Um, I think that's prudent and responsible, um, and I think it clearly provides the financial framework in which we've based those spending commitments. But we are also going into a, a period, and you've talked about the economic challenges as we recover from COVID, where infrastructure investment, investment in tackling some of the deep-seated challenges that the pandemic has shone a light on, does require governments to make decent, sensible, proper investments um, and recover through investment, not through austerity. So I, I think we've put forward a responsible manifesto within that context of the medium term financial strategy. And I'm confident in the robustness of the projections that we're making. And and in the, the, the years ahead, we're obviously going to be quite heavily reliant on business, the business community to, to, to pick up a lot of the slack. Business has spoken about what it feels is a relatively poor relationship with the SNP administration. It was something Benny Higgins picked up on in his report on post-pandemic growth. There's a sense that your government doesn't really... I don't know, understand or have much sympathy for business or, or wealth creation that you're very much more comfortable with the social justice side of things, making stuff free, praising the virtue of the public sector. But business entrepreneurs and innovators are seen as a necessary evil almost, almost as something distasteful. And yet, as I say, they're the people that we will rely on to get us out of this hole, create jobs, improve productivity, return us to healthy growth and pay the taxes that fund our public services. Why doesn't the private sector get more love in Scotland, both from you and, and in general in our political debate? I'm not sure anybody ever feels loved enough by government and maybe with some justification. And I, I take seriously the concerns of the business community in that respect. I just off an hours long Zoom question and answer with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. So we've discussed some of that uh, today as well. Um, I think we've got an opportunity after the last year to reset that relationship, to look at how we deepen and strengthen it and you know, perhaps get beyond just the business organisations to the, the business community at large. That's not to diss or downplay the really important contribution that the, the big six business organisations make, but government not just talking to, listening to, understanding business, but actually using perhaps more of the expertise that business has to offer as we shape our policy. So I, I take that seriously and we'll always try to, to address that. We're not anti-business, we're not unsympathetic to business. To do anything that we want to do requires a strong economy and a thriving business base. I'm a great believer we've got to measure economic success in a, a, a wider sense than we have done before. And But it's also the case, one of the things I have done, um, and perhaps this contributes a little bit to the feeling that I don't listen enough to business, which I would reject, but obviously have to reflect on if that's their view. But I've tried to allow the voices of people and organisations that are traditionally never heard in government mm. to be heard a bit more. Um, you know, whether that's care experience, young people who get really, really raw end of the, the wedge sometimes, or, or whether that is people working in social enterprises and voluntary organisations across the country, people living in poverty. I've, I've tried to make sure that those voices are heard as well, because any government has to take balanced decisions. The economy is vitally important, but there's real structural systemic flaws in our economy that we need to tackle as well. Insecure work, you know, precarious working patterns, the fact that some folk work in jobs where they don't know week to week how many hours they're going to be at working and how much they're going to be earning, inequality and poverty. We don't, we don't maximise the potential of our economy unless we maximise the potential and the well-being of our population. So uh, we've got to make sure all of these voices are being heard in order to 
properly uh, address the the challenges that the country faces. Okay, thanks for that. Well, we'll move on to some questions. We've got about 15 minutes left, so let's see how many we can squeeze in. Uh, we'll go with uh, Jeremy Pete. Jeremy, are you with us? I'm here, yes. Hello. Uh, um, hello, First Minister. Hi. Uh, Chris, you've already put my question, one of my questions, which was about the IFS report. And uh, I would simply say on that, that I always take what the IFS say very seriously. And I would suggest that you have a, a good look to make sure that uh, you can back up what you just said about the assumptions. My second question relates to what you were just saying. What are your policies for actually working towards strong productivity growth, making best use of our labour force, those that are now in the labour force and those coming forward in the, the follow up to the pandemic? Because Scotland has a record over the last decade of rubbish productivity movement and we really have to improve that and improve skill availability and skill use if we're going to achieve all embracing and strong economic growth particularly if we're going to do anything sensible about the public finances in the event of independence thanks jeremy so, Jeremy, just to reassure you, I, I do take seriously what the IFS say and uh, pay close attention to all of the reports, whether the reports that make comfortable reading or, or not. But we you know, think very carefully about manifestos before we publish them as well. And I know you will have read the medium term financial strategy on which it is, is based. That is based on the projections of the Fiscal Commission and the OBR. So... It is sound projections uh, that we have based our own uh, plans on, but we will, of course, uh, since check them against any independent commentary that is, is published around them. Uh, I absolutely agree with you that one of the challenges we face economically is uh, closing the productivity gap. We have actually, over the past 10 years, largely closed the gap in productivity that did exist between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but Scotland still lags significantly behind European competitors in terms of productivity. Uh, there's a number of things we are doing and will continue to do. You mentioned skills that coming out of the pandemic, the, the need to support the reskilling of the workforce uh, is hugely important uh, as people uh, move into jobs in the sectors that will be vital in terms of the, the move to a net zero economy, supporting businesses with uh, R&D investment, with uh, the investments uh, that are critical to driving productivity. Uh, this has got to be an investment-led recovery. Investment in uh, digital skills and digital infrastructure and the digital uh, capabilities of businesses is also an important part of that. I think learning the good and the bad from some of the changes to working patterns that have been necessitated by the pandemic, uh, looking to see whether there are any of those that for the longer term uh, can help us both with the well-being challenge, but also with the productivity uh, challenge uh, as well. But there's, there's no doubt that closing that productivity gap, improving Scottish productivity is one of the key tasks we face over the next wee while. Do you think a four day working week and universal basic income would improve productivity? It potentially, yes. So we've uh, one of the commitments in our manifesto is to uh, establish a fund that would allow companies, that wouldn't compel companies, but companies have got an appetite to do this, to provide them with some funding to explore the benefits and the challenges of moving to a four day working week, which I think does have the potential to improve productivity. Uh, a universal basic income, we can't do that within the current powers of the Scottish Parliament, but I do think we can make some progress towards it to give people greater financial security, to lift people above poverty, which then I think helps create the conditions to improve productivity. And, and I, I think as we come out of this year of total disruption, we've got an opportunity to think about some of these things in a bigger, bolder way than perhaps we've been wont to do in the past. Okay, uh, Ben Walker. Sorry, just had to take myself off mute there, which I should probably know by now after a year of working from home. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, it was great to see your ambitions for a green recovery be included in uh, your manifesto. Uh, I work for Scottish Renewables, 
And our research has shown that for every gigawatt of renewable energy, you can create 1,500 jobs and add 133 million of GVA to our economy. Renewable energy is going to be essential for building the green recovery and our uh, economic recovery from the pandemic. Um, what we would like to see is the appointment of a cabinet secretary for energy and net zero if uh, your government uh, is re-elected on Thursday. And I wanted to ask if this is something you might consider appointing. Um, yes, is the short answer to that, although I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation to start appointing a cabinet before I've actually won the election. But, you know, I, I'm not going to so be betraying any secrets here where I think the challenges we face over the next period means we need to make sure that the, the structure of the cabinet and ministerial appointments uh, are joined up and reflect uh, the challenges and the focus on climate change, the move to net zero, uh, the, the fact that that requires us to do much more around transport, heating of buildings means that we need to have ministerial appointments that reflect that. So um, I think it's fair to say that what you've just put to me there is very much in line with my own thinking around this. Um, you know, the, the the climate change imperative is a, is a moral one. We've got to get to net zero as our contribution to ending climate change and leaving the planet for future generations. But if we do it properly, there is a massive economic opportunity. And you've just highlighted that with the figures that you have, have used. We've been massively successful so far. Almost 100% of our electricity is now from renewables, but we've got to do the same in heating, in transport, in agriculture, in all of these different sectors. And if we do it right, if we focus on the justice of the transition, we can create really high quality, sustainable jobs for the future. So it's a massive opportunity as well as a, a big moral obligation. Okay, thanks for that. There you go, there's a scoop for you, maybe. Um, John Glenn. Good afternoon, First Minister. I'm not sure, Chris, which of the questions did you want me to ask? Oh, I thought your first one uh, looked All quite right. interesting. I do um, too. Yes, obviously, I'm interested in, in finding out in the, if we're having another referendum, how will the public be educated to understand what the real deal is with our partners, particularly the rest of the UK, but eventually potentially with the, the European Union? And how do we avoid the anomalies that we had in our choice on Brexit? Well, can I say, I, I, even if I thought it was going to make it much, much more likely to win an independence referendum, I would never want to have a, an independence referendum that was like the Brexit referendum, where people were just not leveled with or given any information on which to really base that decision. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just not how I'm interested in winning independence. In 2014, you know, we put forward a very detailed prospectus. Some people thought it was compelling, some people didn't, but we put a lot of work into answering the questions as far as we could, recognising where, you know, some questions can't be answered definitively because we can't see into the future and judge every you know, challenge that might come our way, we will do the same before any uh, future referendum. As it happens, I think we have uh, even more uh, reason to be very confident that our future would lie within the European Union. I was always confident of that the last time, but I think Brexit has changed the attitude of the European Union and member states significantly, and we will set out the, the areas in which we would be seeking to negotiate with the UK government and the outcomes we would be seeking uh, to achieve. And uh, we'll set that out in the fullest possible detail for people. We've, we've got to all recognise, though, that as I said a moment ago, you can't predict the future completely. And, you know, whatever uh, Scotland's constitutional future is. Things happen, a pandemic has just happened, and the importance is having the right arrangements and the right levers at your disposal uh, to meet those challenges head on. Would you have a, a confirmatory vote or an election to follow to make sure that we were voting from a position of knowing what the deal would be? I've never really, I've never favoured that um, for a very specific reason. Um, 
but I also think if you do your job up front and you put forward a very clear proposition to people, then you're allowing an informed decision to be made. And then that decision is taken forward to be implemented. The reason why I came to support not a confirmatory, but a second referendum on the EU was that that was not the case. People didn't know what they were voting for and then went right through a negotiation without it ever really becoming clear what Brexit meant in practice. I think the problem with a confirmatory referendum, this is just my view, is that you effectively encourage, in our case, it would be the UK government, not to enter into a good faith negotiation because they would work on the basis that could just overturn the result later on if they if they made the negotiation as tough as they possibly could. And, and I think it, it actually makes it less likely that you have a democratic decision that people then respect and go on to implement in good faith, which is actually what I think in reality would happen uh, when we get to that stage. OK, well, let, let's move on. One final question. <laughs> which uh, hopefully be something quite upbeat. Uh, Kirsty Peebles. Hi, First Minister. Um, thank you for a really interesting sort of discussion and, and, and answering questions so candidly. Um, I was wondering if there was an area, I appreciate you have sort of a cabinet secretaries sort of doing these visits, but I wonder if there was an area of early stage or emerging innovation that had caught your attention that you think is exciting and its potential for Scotland. I think a lot of the early stage work that's been done around uh, artificial intelligence is absolutely fascinating. The work our universities are doing and the spin-off uh, potential of that. I, you know, I've seen lots of examples of that. Um, you know, Glasgow, the city I'm sitting in here right now, is the you know preeminent city in Europe for you know small satellite for space uh, work. That is really exciting. I. It, particularly in my days as health secretary, um, carrying on into to my time as first minister, some of the the work that's been done around precision uh, medicine in Scotland, uh, which is the future of of healthcare, is really you know fascinating and and hugely important. And then there's all the the green technology uh, sustainability uh, work that's underway. I think one of the great strengths we have as a country is an in innovation. One of the weaknesses. Uh, perhaps relative weaknesses in the past has been uh, not turning that innovation into the homegrown companies of scale uh, that we, we need to see. And that's one of the things that we've got to get better at. But I, I think we have a lot to be very proud about and very excited about in terms of the quality of the innovation that we see in our universities and in our business base across the country. Thank you very much, First Minister, for your, your time. And uh, we shall watch carefully to see whether you manage to sneak over the line next <laughs> Thursday. Not getting ahead of ourselves here. Uh, thanks also to everyone in the audience for coming along. Uh, I thought that was a really good conversation. As I said at the start, this is our final event before Election Day, but we'll be back with a bang afterwards. So keep an eye on your inboxes. Uh, finally, I just hope everyone's going to vote whichever way you want to vote. Uh, and let's do our best to keep Scottish politics and its debate positive, polite, empathetic, regardless of your views, because we all have to live with the consequences. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Thanks again, First Minister. Thank and you. we'll see you all again soon. Thanks.